Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Nukiatna, PhD, as the chairperson of uh, today's uh, discussion. To Mr. Nurgiatna, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ta'ala la syarika lah wa asyhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Allahumma shalli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi washabbihi ajma'in. Thank you Dr. Happy and <coughs> welcome to the International Conference on Science, Technology and Humanity. <coughs> and Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Nurgi Adna, a lecturer in Informatic Engineering. You can call me Nurgi. And I will be serving as your moderator for this session. And we have uh, actually the conference committee arranged to have three speakers, but unfortunately that one of the speakers, Professor Kido from Japan, cannot join us here. So apologize for this. But don't worry, we still have two speakers, one from uh, Malaysia and one from Australia. So, I don't want to be alone uh, on this stage, so I would like to invite the first speaker to join me in, on, in this stage. Um, he is from Malaysia a PhD in computer science, uh, sorry, I have many papers here. A uh, professor in computer science and informatic technology from University of Ushetun Hussein on Malaysia. Uh, His research interest is data grid, uh, distributed databases of set and reverse theory, and he published more than 200 papers in journals and in proceedings with age index 12 in Scopus. <clears throat> uh, please help me in welcoming Professor Dr. Mustafa B. Madderis. And the second speaker from Australia is an associate professor of pedagogy and learning at the Charles Darwin University and leader of the Digital Education Food System in International Graduate Center for Education. Sorry, I took this from your website. <laughs> and his research interests are in the field of digital technologies, education and society. In particular, his current research focus in the relationship between programming, oh, programming, still have strong relation with Prof. Mustafa from computer science, yeah? socio-economic control and resistance, otherwise expressed as coding and social justice. Please help me welcoming <laughs> Professor Lawrence Tamatea. And we have about one and a half hours for this session. So I will divide it into three subsections or to three portions. The first 30 minutes for the first speaker, the second 30 minutes for the second speaker, and the rest is for question and answer session. 
So let us start by the first speaker, Professor Mustafa bin Madaris. Time is yours then. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan uh, selamat pagi. Uh, Sugeng Enjan. <laughs> no Sugeng Enjan. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you clear? Can you see it? Okay, inshallah. Um, Your Highness, uh, Bapak Rektor, Professor Bambang, uh, Vice Rectors, uh, Pak Gunawan, uh, Dr. Nurgian, uh, as a chairperson, uh, Bapak Lawrence, as our keynote speaker as well, Pak Bana, my former students and ladies and gentlemen, uh, selamat pagi dan sugan enjang. Uh, sugan enjang. Good morning, right? Uh, can I sit down? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, cannot, cannot. It's okay. I can. If you want to stand up, I can open this laptop. No, it's okay. Then. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sugananjan and Maturnoon. Yeah. Two words. I learned two words today. Uh, this is uh, my uh, presentation, my itinerary of presentation, uh, introduction. Uh, today, I would like to discuss on and to share with you on incomplete information systems, issues and challenges. Uh, rough set theory for IIS, incomplete information system, future direction, and question and answer. Uh, try my best to take 30 minutes uh, for your time, and hopefully. You can enjoy with uh, my presentation. As we look here, Graham Bell. Uh, the innovator of the uh, telephone uh, in 1876. Graham Bell uh, patterned uh, the new discovery or new innovation on telecommunication, that is uh, telephone. And uh, after that, today, if we look at today, we have uh, with the technology, we have a very fantastic uh, telephone with the handphone as well. You go to anywhere, even to the moon, you can easily communicate with your parents. See? Um, so, in between, we can see here, we can see here, this is research. Right? The research and innovation comes in the middle, otherwise it is very difficult to introduce or to improve uh, the telephone or other things until today. So many things need research and innovation, otherwise we cannot uh, uh, stay longer uh, with the current technology as well as uh, um, current information. That is uh, telephone. Another one is uh, You see the classical car introduced by Benz, Benz uh, from Germany in 1886. And today we have modern cars, A7. Babana uh, would like to buy a new one, A7, Audi A7. You see? 
And uh, on the left, on the right, on your right is Porsche. But currently, uh, we have a new type of cars, that is the hybrid cars, uh, introduced by Honda, the combination between petrol and battery. So, based on that uh, 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 innovation, we can see that uh, information is important. Data and information is so important to any discipline. So today I would like to concentrate on the information and uh, in my area, we would like to focus on the incomplete information system and uh, inshallah, I'll, I will explain to you afterwards. So based on this scenario, based on these two scenarios, we have uh, data and information which are very important to us, right? So basically, for science and technology, in order to make hum human better living, we need information, we need uh, innovation and research. And of course, research and innovation, you cannot run, run away with the data and in, uh, information. So based on that, Based on that, uh, I would say again, information is so important to us. Now, let's begin with the uh, information. What is the difference between data, information, and knowledge? I give you just a simple example, simple analogy for the person. For the data, what a person looks like, high, with hair, either white or black, or with no hair, like myself, skin color, and many things. That is data. But the information is the person itself, the photograph of a person. But the knowledge is what we know about that person. That is knowledge. So that is the difference between data, information, and knowledge. And these three very much related between one another. And therefore, Information is so important to us. Then I would like to concentrate on this one. So information can be displayed in many, many, many ways. One of which is through graph. Through um, bills, like, um, you know, electric bills. And the most common thing is uh, through uh, relations or through database a two-dimensional database that consists of rows and columns, right? So it's like this. So based on this, we can easily discover knowledge. Once we have uh, information, we can easily discover knowledge. For instance, uh, we can find rules in order to support a process of uh, data classification, such as uh, for the old guy, you know, for the old guy, the disease for the old guy is different as compared to uh, kids or youngsters. Such as, uh, if, you look, if, if we look at here, basically uh, the old guys or the old person, usually they cannot run away from coronary problems, stroke, cancer, so on and so forth. But for the kids, usually they have influenza, chicken pox, smallpox, and many, many things. So, based on that, uh, many scientists uh, define the information system uh, as a quadruple that consists of non-empty finite set of objects with the entities uh, with a non-finite set of uh, attributes uh, and the value for each attribute, we call it uh, domain of attributes. Just giving a simple example here, uh, I think all of you are uh, quite familiar with uh, this kind of information, such as uh, we have uh, four occurrences of four objects, and 
for the function of program, program is attribute 1004, that is accounting. For the function of origin, for 103, is ratio, so on and so forth. So these are, we call it a relational database, which is very important to everybody or to uh, policy makers. Now, information system can be categorized into two categories. One is complete system, a complete information, and another one is incomplete information. Now, I would like to focus on the incomplete information system. Uh, we call it um, imprecise. Imprecise or incomplete information system. Then, in, the imprecise information system uh, can either be missing of attributes, combined attributes or missing data and etc. I give you a simple example here. This is uh, imprecise information. For instance, uh, uh, housing, house pricing. Uh, the first one is uh, constant spread. That is from 8 to from 6.2 to 9.8, so in average is um, 8 point, because uh, 8 point, you minus 1.8, we got 6.2, so on and so forth. This is a fuzzy number. So the variation is about 1.8. Uh, forecasting spread and decreasing spread. That is the house pricing, example of the imprecise information system. Another one is, uh, Another one is uh, with the one that we have shown just now, cars, you see. We have a car description that consists of uh, price, mileage, size, and maximum speed. For the A7, for instance, the price is very high, mileage is so high, the size is full, and maximum, sp maximum speed might be high because uh, the Porsche or A7 can run up to 200 kilometers per hour or might be more than that, which Pak Bana uh, would like to buy soon, inshallah. I do not know where does the money comes from. That's example. So, based on the database that we have, for instance, we have the asterisk for the value of certain attribute. So, the asterisk shows the missing value of the attribute. So we are interested to do this, uh, to process this, uh, in order we can easily get the information or get knowledge from this kind of database or this kind of information. Right. This example. So how to deal with incomplete information system in developing rules and classification in order for us to make a very accurate decision. That is very important to us. So what is appropriate technique for incomplete information system, for instance? So several solutions to the problem have been proposed. One is the simplest is to remove object with missing values. That is very unfortunate. So we have uh, uh, very inaccurate information. Another one is uh, replacing missing values with the most common values. This one, we need a statistical information. Otherwise, we cannot do that, right? So, based on that, we can easily replace it based on statistical. And this is commonly used uh, by many researchers and also by many decision makers. However, it needs uh, the probability uh, parameters in advance. That is very difficult for us. And therefore, we have to come up with a new concept or new approach in order to overcome these kind of problems. So, 
One of which is through what we call rough set theory. We have so many ways of doing that. One of which is through rough set theory. Uh, rough set theory was developed uh, in early 1980s by Polak from Poland in 1980s and he died uh, four years ago. He passed away four years ago. Uh, the father of uh, rough set theory. And rough set theory basically uh, discussed on the approximation. And that is why rough set theory is so important, especially in incomplete information system. So uh, today, here, I would like to share with you the rough set theory and how rough set theory managed uh, to overcome the problems that involve or that occur in incomplete information system. So basically, this is a quite technical. Uh, basically, it is based on upper and lower approximation. And uh, based on that, we can get uh, the purity or the accuracy uh, from the rough set theory. So uh, just a simple example here. Um, we can easily uh, get the accuracy or the approximation is about 0 0.6 based on rough set theory with this kind of information. And therefore, we can see that uh, some information which are important to us but sometimes some values of the information does not appear in the database. And this is very important to us. How do we manage that kind of information? Right. I want to skip this one because uh, this one is quite technical. Right. Rough set theory basically uh, they consider the tolerance relations uh, in order to manage the incomplete information system. This uh, uh, has been done by the so-called uh, by Zhang, Yao, and Yi. Uh, the, the first initiator of the incomplete information, the first initiator of the usage of rough set theory in incomplete information system. And after that, we found that tolerance nation is not uh, accurate based on this kind of technical uh, approach. And therefore, this has been improved by others. This one is quite technical. I want to skip this one because time is very consuming. Uh, I just would like to show you uh, why uh, the approach is, in, is not uh, accurate. For instance, in this case, uh, the missing attribute of uh, A11 is considered similar to A1, whereas A1 is complete information and A11 is not complete. So, because of that reason, uh, we see that the approach is not as good as what we wanted. So, definitely, uh, the approach need to be improved. Another one is by Stefanowski from Poland, uh, introduced the so-called non-symmetric similarity relation in order to improve the accuracy as well as the approximation. Uh, based on this one, we found that uh, it is more accurate, more informative, and intuitively expected to be classified into a different classification, which is the, uh, the, the, the approach is some kind of improvement as compared to the one that I have shown to you just now. If you want to know clearly, I will give you uh, the slide after this. <laughs> and uh, another one is a limited tolerance relation produced, uh, introduced by Wang uh, in 2002. They improved the non-symmetric similarity uh, introduced by Stavanovsky. And uh, from this one, we can see that uh, the approach is more reasonable 
and in terms of processing, uh, Wang approach is much better as compared to Stevanovsky. However, they have some drawback from this kind of approach. I want to skip this one. Uh, Yeah. However, the complete information system cannot be classified clearly. Uh, for instance, in the, in case for A1, uh, they have a complete information system. But uh, from this approach, A1 has complete. But this approach is not in the lower approximation, and therefore the approach is not the so-called hundred percent good, or is not. Uh, 100% uh, uh, accurate and therefore we introduce a new approach we need to introduce a new approach by overcome this kind of problems Nguyen from 2013 Nguyen uh, from Vietnam and he's the former student of the Polite uh, Nguyen is quite popular now he is in Canada uh, but originally from Vietnam, uh, introduced as standard tolerance relations and very unfortunate, I would say that very unfortunate because it need to know the probability distribution of the data and yeah, that's good, 10 minutes, I have 10 more minutes to go, yeah, of the data in advance and therefore this approach also have some kind of difficulties. Now, what are other approaches need to be Propose. So this year, I propose a new approach by taking into consideration the similarity and also the threshold value uh, between one attribute to another. Uh, we just managed to publish in ICT Innovation in Macedonia. Uh, from this one, Based on the uh, threshold value, we found that our approach is about accuracy, is about one, which is very good, and uh, the approximation becomes better and better. Right. What about future direction? We just discussed on the very small data, small set of data, what happened to the big data? Uh, because today we have we have a problems on big data, whereby big data play major roles in any discipline, especially in business or in any decision making, right? And therefore we have to come up with uh, the suitable approach in order to suit with the, the so-called big data. Does the rough set with the one that we have discussed just now uh, suitable for the big data? I don't think so. And therefore we have to think together either rough set or soft set or might be on other approaches because big data is so important to us nowadays um, not only uh, in Malaysia but also throughout the world and therefore we need to improve the approaches uh, in order to become more suitable especially to big data issues right as far as big data is concerned uh, the number of data stored in computer every day is more than one, one, zit, uh, one no, a thousand terabyte, uh, one hexabyte, more than one hexabyte per day, which is very huge. We can afford to, especially to mine the information from this kind of uh, huge information, right? And there must be some way of doing that in order to mine or to get the information or to get knowledge from the big data. So, <clears throat> just uh, glance through on issues on big data that consists of volume, velocity, variety, variability and complexity that need appropriate approach for better efficiencies, um, cost reduction and reduced risk and so on. 
and so many things for the big data. So, does the approach have been discussed just now applicable for big data or not applicable or not suitable, especially to the incomplete information? Because we have so many information which are incomplete, either in Malaysia, either in Indonesia, or any other countries. And therefore, incomplete information system is so important to us and need to be managed and need to be uh, done by some other approaches in order to say that the incomplete information system is also important to us. So, that's what I said here. Beside the rough set theory, the other approaches are needed, such as soft set theory or other soft computing discipline. Uh, that is to deal with the incomplete big data environment where efficiencies, cost reduction and reduces are three major attributes to be considered. Now, uh, it is our challenge to us and this is important to us and I left, I left to you if you are interested to do uh, this kind of uh, uh, discipline then you can easily contact Mr. Bana. Uh, Dr. Bana Handaga from UMS or you can easily contact me through my email inshallah um, we can discuss after um, after this session uh, that is all uh, from my sharing presentation with you yeah, especially in incomplete information system thank you That was an interesting topic, especially for me, because uh, I used to deal with incomplete data, or incomplete information system when I uh, <laughs> did my PhD project. But it's not important for me, but the most important for the participants, uh, I hope that all of you find that it's interesting as well. And I'm sure that we do have questions, but just keep it until the question and answer session, because we move on into the second speaker, uh, please, uh, Professor Lawrence Tamatea, it's time for yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful presentation, Professor. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to the Rector, Vice Rector, Heads of Departments, uh, academic colleagues and students and guests. Uh, I'm very honoured to be able to have the opportunity uh, to present here today. Uh, my presentation, uh, the title is Coding and Decoding Baudrillard's Digital Matrix, Understanding the Implications of the Digital Paradigm. So, And so, when I was asked a couple of months ago uh, if I'd like to be a uh, keynote speaker for this event, uh, I had a look at the promotional material there and I was really very excited because the promotional material uh, that is online that we can all see talks about sustainability, humanity, crisis, freedom, citizens and concerns. And importantly in relation to the theme of science and information technology, it talks about mass destruction technology and it talks about a society or a humanity that, uh, potentially devoid of meaning. And so I thought, yes, I think I can do that because this is a, an area of research uh, and thinking which aligns very closely to the research uh, that I'm working on at the moment. And the other thing there is the interests were uh, cross-disciplinary. So we have computing, social sciences, and education. Uh, and they are exactly the three areas that I happen to work in. I cross all of those particular boundaries. And so in this presentation this afternoon, we'll be looking at the following areas. One is the ubiquity of the digital. Two is the digital paradigm in Baudrillard's three orders of simulacra. We'll be looking at the problems 
we'll be putting Baudrillard's theories to work. We'll be having a look at the disclaimers. And at the end, we'll look at keeping it real with Baudrillard. So I think, as you will see, my position on all of this is uh, as, uh, one, as a very amateurish computer programmer, uh, two, as an educationalist, and three, as a philosopher of these sorts of things. And for me, uh, the really important question is why? So as we had mentioned earlier on, uh, the digital paradigm is all around us. It is absolutely everywhere. And I think if you have Windows 10 on your computer at the moment, you will uh, notice this character here who is Cortana. On Windows 10 PCs, Cortana performs a role very similar to Siri in the Apple platform. Okay? And, but Cortana comes from a computer game called Halo. So for you who have played Halo 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over the last 10 years, you will know that Cortana was the artificial intelligence that guided the Master Chief around the universe. And now it's in our computer systems. So what I'm going to be looking at today is what is often known as Grin Technology. And Grin Technology stands for Genetics, Robotics, information, and nanotechnology. They are often all linked together, but my interest today is purely on the information part of that equation. So, it seems to be that the digital paradigm just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing, and it shows no sign of turning backwards. I think we've gone past the tipping point. And it's interesting to theorise why the digital seems to have so many advantages. Why is it so attractive to humans? And I've put together a little bit of a list. It's very stereotypical. It's not entirely accurate, but hopefully this list highlights some of the advantages of digital agents or entities compared to human beings. And so, if you run down any of those criteria on the list, on the left, and compare it to what the human being does, the digital agents have the potential to do these things better, quicker, faster, and so on. So you think of all the time, all the years that we spend on educating somebody, us analog human beings, when you can write programs and upgrade the knowledge transfer rate of machines and computers just like that. Huge, huge potential and uh, some really significant advantages. And I don't know if you know this character here. This was Agent Smith from the Matrix, okay? He was the digital agent, just like in that list, replication multiplied quicker, faster, all those sorts of things. But the question for me is always this. What does this mean? How are we to understand this? And this is where I draw upon sociology and philosophy to make sense of the digital paradigm. In this, I draw upon the work of a French philosopher called John. John, I'm not a French person, I'm probably saying that wrong, but John will do for me. John Baudrillard. And he was uh, a man of 77 when he passed away, not too long ago, from France. And his areas were sociology, philosophy, and the cultural provocation. So why Baudrillard? Well, going back to the Matrix, Baudrillard had this theory about simulation and simulacra. And his theory was used to write the Matrix trilogy. Not many people know that. There's a really big clue in that film. When Neo gets the book and he puts his illegal computer disc in there, from the outside it looks like a real book. But it, it opens up and it's empty. It's hollow. So the book is a simulation of a book. And so Baudrillard, for those people who knew Baudrillard, 
there's the big clue right there. This movie was based on Baudrillard's ideas and we didn't even know it. And so for Baudrillard, he's interested in how simulation has moved forwards throughout history. And he refers to this as the procession of simulacra. And simulacra, quite simply, is something that replaces reality with its representation. To understand Baudrillard, who can be very complex, I think three orders of simulacra are the important uh, parts of his theory. And Baudrillard says that unlike the Marxists, for example, who say economics and is the engine of human history, Baudrillard says that the sign is, representation, symbols, semiotics and those sorts of things. And I think you can see that happening in the digital paradigm. So he offers a theory which says throughout history there's been three orders of simulacra or representation. The first of those occurred in the pre-modern era, so the era before our current time, when humanity believed there was one reality and that the signs and the symbols and the art that we could put together would capture that reality. In other words, the paintings that you could see on the caves, such as those in France, had a uh, connection, profound connection with the reality or the spirituality behind all of reality. So in one sense, they were actually pretending to have something that they didn't. But that was a pre-modern era. In the second order of simulacra, which is the modern era, we get into simulation proper. And the key about this particular time is it's based on the industrial model of production, mass production, and we shift to a technology in the form of photographs that allows us to make copies of reality. And so the artwork at that particular time in human history was based on what they call realism. In modernity, we wanted to paint a real copy of reality. In other words, a simulation of reality. And so you get companies like Kodak with photography saying, take a picture and you will be able to capture reality. So it's a simulation of reality. And that belonged to the second order or the industrial era of humanity. But that's pre-digital because what happened to Kodak? I think they disappeared. They did not move with the times. They're in the second order, not the third. And we live in the third order of simulacra. And the third order is our time. It's the digital, and the digital is all around us. And so, what are the characteristics of this order? This is a time of pure simulation. And if you're a person who plays too many computer games like me, you can see it started way back in the 70s with very simple computer games like this. Uh, so this was a simulation, perhaps, of playing tennis. And it moved on to Space Invaders, and it moved on to games like that. And we're at the stage now where we have this. A lot of people struggle to tell whether this is a computer-generated human face or a real one? Well, the answer is it's computer generated. And if you see the video that goes with it, it's absolutely amazing because it shows expressions and emotions and all those sorts of things. Uh, this is only 2015. This digital paradigm has just started. So the question is, where is it going to go in the, in the many years to come? So more real than real, and that's what Baudrillard said. Okay, so Baudrillard says we live in a time of abstraction. Our reliance on computing-based models and numbers and statistics and all those sorts of things create a world where we are distant from reality and we produce knowledge about the world through abstraction. And the important thing is, whereas once we produced a map to simulate a territory, 
what he is saying now in the digital era is we no longer need that analog territory. We work from the map or the representation only. And once upon a time, if we wanted to produce real knowledge about something, we'd say, yes, I know it's real because I can smell it, I can touch it, I can see it. Analog, analog human beings generally like to interact with analog things in their world and that generates reality for us. And so getting back to the matrix, I just have a 